This is Laura Collins, Chair of the Guilford Conservation Commission. This presentation on invasive plants, a growing concern, was presented on November 7th of 2018 by Lindsay Soar, Land Conservation Director at the Connecticut Forest and Park Association. These are the characteristics of invasive plants. They're non-native. They can be terrestrial and aquatic. They cause environmental harm in minimally managed areas. They cause economic harm. They cause harm to human health. And they can be introduced either accidentally or intentionally. Let's consider what makes a plant invasive. It will have aggressive growth habits. It will have prolific seed production. There will be a rapid vegetative spread. They'll disperse over wide distances. And there's a lack of natural enemies. Invasive plants actually change their habitat. They monopolize space. They shade out native plants. They steal moisture and nutrients from the soil. They actually change the soil characteristics. They're lower in nutrients, so they're the last resort for native animals to eat. And they smother and strangle other vegetation. While all invasive plants are non-native, not all non-native plants are actually invasive. Uh, here is an example. A yellow flag iris is a non-native plant, and it is invasive. However, the sub Siberian iris is a non-native plant, and it is non-invasive. Here's an example of a pretty unpleasant plant. However, it is non-invasive. Our friend, poison ivy. The following are some specific examples of these invasive plants common in Connecticut. The first category is trees, shrubs, and woody vines. Our first example is the Norway maple. The second example is tree of heaven. And now we'll transition over to Lindsay Soar, her voice, and the remainder of her presentation. Thank you. It is one of these species that is alleliopathic so it chemically inhibits the growth of other plants. So you're going you're gonna to have a very hard time growing anything else next to or, or around it. And then it has an extensive root system that can sometimes damage sewer lines, sometimes damage foundations. Uh, so it's, it's, not a, it's not a fun plant. <laughs> uh, porcelain berry. This is one I dealt extensively with in uh, Greenwich. Uh, it was growing, at, like in this picture, up and over everything. Uh, it, there was an area where there were invasive shrubs on the bottom and a couple invasive, invasive trees, and it was growing up over all of them. Um, so it was at least shading those, those plants out. But it's a climbing vine. It looks a little bit like native grape. Uh, it has really pretty berries, which I think is why it's here. Um, they turn bright blue, sometimes purple. Some of them are even like a whitish color. Uh, but you can tell them apart, grape and porcelain berry, because the pith or the interior of the stems, uh, grape is brown and porcelain berry is white. So if you, you know, break it open, if it's white, it's definitely porcelain berry, not grape. And then, like I said before, it creates thick mats on the ground, up and over trees, and it sh shades out natives and takes down trees. Bittersweet, which I'm sure most of you have seen. <laughs> and if you haven't, now you will, because it's everywhere. Uh, it grows in wide variety of habitats and quickly disturbs, uh, invade, invades disturbed areas. It's one of the strangler vines. So it strangles, it climbs everything, and the weight of it topples trees. But it can sometimes get, I've seen, I've actually cut with a chainsaw, ones that get, you know, four inches in diameter. They get humongous, and sometimes you can even see where they've grown up around a tree. There'll be a spiral, and the tree will be long dead, but it still has the same form where it grew up the tree, um, and, the, and it just it strangles and kills lots of them. Uh, it spreads by seeds, but also root suckers. So if you cut it and leave it and don't do anything else, don't try to pull the roots out or you know put a little chemical on it, it will it'll be a thousand times worse the next time you come out. So it's a really tough one uh, to manage in a large forested uh, landscape. 
There's a, there is a native look-alike, which you'll be hard-pressed to find these days, I think. <laughs> American bittersweet. Um, native has flowers and fruit at the end of the branches, but the oriental one has, has them along the branches of the axles of the leaves. So if you are suspecting, go and find um, maybe pictures of both and see what that means versus axles versus, um, versus at the end. And if you do have American bittersweet, clear whatever else is near it because it's, it's slowly, well not slowly, it's, it's uh, hard to find these days. Japanese barberry. A uh, spiny shrub grows in a wide variety of habitats. It has a really large number of, of seeds and high germination rates. A lot of times in the woods, if you go out early spring, it's one of the first things to be green. Uh, I, it's funny. If I go out in April and it's, it's relatively warm, pretty much everything I can see that's green is Japanese barberry. So you'll know once you see it, um, early in the spring, green. It's found to alter the pH and biological activity of the soil, so it reduces native wildflower uh, growth. And then also recent research uh, at the Connecticut uh, Agricultural Experiment Station found that it's a great habitat for deer ticks. So it creates kind of the right moisture levels, the right pH, and ticks love it. Uh, I don't know if it's because there's more mice underneath it, more rodents, but when they do surveys for ticks, they find in, in uh, environments with barberry, it's just high, high elevated uh, amounts of ticks. So recently, we, we acquired a new property up in Tolland, and most of it is a great property, but the southwest portion has a large patch of barberry, which we just haven't gotten to yet. And I, I walked through there, and I took my dog, and I, I came out, and for two days we pulled ticks off of us, but I found 15 on me and like 40 to 50 ticks on her. So it is a crazy tick breed. I mean, it has so many ticks on it. Um, it's not the only plant, but it's, they found high concentrations just on that plant. And then a distinguishing characteristic, if you do pull it up and you break the root, it has this like, bright, vibrant yellow color that you're not going to see in any other root system in Connecticut. Autumn olive. It was introduced as an ornamental, um, mostly because of the silvery, shiny, they're actually very pretty, undersides of the leaves. Um, it's, it like, it's like it has sparkles on it. It's something, um, if you've seen it, it's, it's very pretty. They can reach a height of 20 feet, uh, grows mostly in open sites, on edges, along roadsides. Uh, they have nitrogen fixing capabilities, which can affect some of the native communities. Um, and then they produce a ton of fruit that's eaten by wildlife, but they're pretty low in nutrients. So the seeds get spread like crazy, but it's not providing very much nutrients for native wildlife. Uh, burning bush, the property behind our office, they planted it around a house and it has just taken over the <laughs> entire property. Um, it's a very, very, very common plant to be seen in rural, I mean, suburb, suburban settings. It has beautiful fall foliage. Um, unfortunately, it can still be purchased in Connecticut. So our list of 97 species, some have been banned. Um, and aren't allowed to be sold, but some didn't get on the ban list, um, mostly because there's some landscape groups that were involved in deciding whether this happened, and political reasons, they didn't all get banned. And this is one that's not banned, and so you can still buy it in some nurseries, and it, it's everywhere. I mean, it's, it's cheap to purchase. I think it's pretty cheap for the nurseries to grow, so it continues to be sold across the state. A distinguishing characteristic, uh, the corky wings. Um, you won't see that on, I don't think, any other plants in Connecticut. Uh, if you've come in contact with them, they're pretty distinguishable. 
It grows in sun, but it likes shade also, and it takes over woodlands like crazy. <laughs> and it's also an amazing seed producer. Um, typically, it'll drop seed, you know, right next to itself. So if it's in the woodlands, you'll have you'll then have a monoculture of euonymus in the woods. And this is sort of what it looks like in the woodlands when it takes over. So it becomes sort of the only plant that you see. <laughs> uh, Japanese honeysuckle. It was planted as an ornamental. Has very sweet, fragrant flowers, which is why it was used. It was also used for um, erosion control when it was first planted. It's evergreen or semi-evergreen woody vine. The leaves stay somewhat green through winter and it likes disturbed sites and roadsides. So it can strangle and kill small saplings and it forms pretty dense mats in some tree canopies. Um, my experience is I haven't seen this one as much as some of the other vines, but it certainly in some situations can take over. And then this is the last uh, shrub. So multiflora rose, many of you have probably seen. It was first introduced for erosion control, livestock fencing, crash barrier along uh, roadsides. Very thorny shrub, but it can also climb up trees. So it, it sort of reaches, it's like, it has like tendrils and it sort of reaches up trees and grows up trees as well. It likes wet and open areas, but it can take over woodlands as well. So this is the one that it said, it's estimated that a single plant can produce a million seeds per year, which can remain in the soil viable for 20 years. So even if you get rid of your base, if, there, if it has been seeding and it's been there, you have at least 20 years of follow-up to do. So that's the problem with invasive plants. So there's, there's less herbaceous that I'm going to go through, but these are some of the worst ones that I've seen. Uh, garlic mustard, it was introduced for culinary or medicinal purposes. If you break the leaf, it does have a garlicky smell, and you can use it in pestos. It has like a more earthy taste, but it certainly can be used. Uh, it's a biennial herb, so it takes two years to complete its life cycle. It starts as a basil rosette. Oops, sorry. It starts as a basil rosette, which looks like this. And then it stays green throughout the winter and then matures the following spring. So it's very shade tolerant prolific seed producer, and then it forms dense mats um, like that in forested landscapes, shades out native wildflowers, and it's also allelopathic, so it creates um, chemicals that inhibit the seed germination of other species. Is Purple it leaves. It has little white, little white flowers. You can sort of see them. They're not very showy. You can sort of see them there. Um, and then this, this is the seed pods. And when they dry out, they drop so many seeds. Uh, purple loosestrife, uh, it's mostly wetland. Uh, it'll grow up kind of into wetlands and then up off the banks in wetlands. It was introduced because it's clearly beautiful. <laughs> it's very pretty. Um, it can co colonize a wide range of uh, wet sites, so freshwater, tidal marshes. Um, it can tolerate a range of pH and also it can tolerate drought. So it, it has this extended flowering season, June through September, um, and it, it produces even more seeds than multiflora rose. So it can produce two to three million <laughs> seeds per year. So it it can take off. I mean, it's it's crazy. If you have just a few, get rid of them because they're, you know, they're easier to get rid of when there's just a few. Um, and then they produce monocultures like this, reduce habitat for, for waterfowl, clog waterways, and then disrupt nutrient cycling. So they cause a lot of damage to the environment. Uh, Japanese silkgrass is one that we're seeing more and more these days. Um, it's an annual that grows one to three feet in height. It grows in a wide variety of habitats. They, the seeds move easily, so they get stuck in animal feet, human shoes, 
Uh, so you see them a lot along trail paths on the sides of trails. Uh, equipment moves them a lot. So if people are doing any kind of you know soil movement or forestry work, many times they're finding that after the fact they're getting uh, Japanese still grass. Um, sometimes in like hay or mulch as well, you can find uh, Japanese still grass seeds. They remain viable for five or more years, and then they create monocultures like you can see in these pictures. And then they change soil nutrient cycling processes. So every, all these invasives are changing the soil characteristics, which make it harder for natives to grow. It's also unpalatable to deer and other wildlife, so nothing is eating it. Uh, this is probably a plant most of you have seen, especially in Guilford, um, down along the shoreline. Tall perennial grass, it can reach 15 feet in height. Uh, dense network of roots and rhizomes, they reach a depth of about 3 feet underground. Grows in tidal, non-tidal, freshwater, wetlands, along roadsides. Produces seed in abundance, but the seed is supposedly has low viability, so it's mostly spreading by rhizomes which if a fragment of a rhizome gets cut off and gets into the water, that's how it's spreading along shorelines. Um, also transported by equipment, the same as a lot of these species. And it changes the hydrology, crowds out natives, and increases the fire potential, which a lot of people don't think of, but in the uh, non-growing season, this, if this sits without being mowed, it, it has a high fire potential. <laughs> Uh, Japanese knotweed, introduced for ornamental use in erosion control. This is the one that they found. It's actually not that good for erosion control, even though that's what it was introduced for. It's on the edges of wetlands, roadsides, disturbed sites, utility right-of-ways. If you look in Connecticut, you're going to find Japanese knotweed. Uh, annual, has a hollow stem, kind of resembles bamboo. Some people think it's bamboo, but they're different species. Um, Early in the season, which is crazy, new shoots can grow three to four inches per day. So sometimes if you go out and you know there's a patch, you'll go out one week and you know it's very low and then the next week it's like up here. How did that happen? Because it grows very, very fast, um, takes off, spreads primarily by rhizomes. Um, so same thing as Phragmites, if the rhizome gets cut, uh, gets into water, can spread on equipment, water, that's how it gets uh, changed to other places. Doesn't produce much seed that's viable, um, but still is finding a way to take over <laughs> Connecticut. Uh, and it can actually increase bank erosion. So even though it was originally brought in for that, it's not very good for erosion. Uh, and it also clogs waterways, reducing the quality of habitat. And this is probably what many of you have seen, something like that. And then last species I'm going to talk about is Mile a Minute. Um, I hope none of you have seen this one. Uh, I think it's in most counties in Connecticut these days. Uh, it's an annual vine and can grow up to six inches per day, which is why it's called Mile a Minute weed. It sprawls over vegetation trees, uh, shades out natives. Its berries float. So if it's in a near a wetland area, um, it spreads along riparian corridors. Um, and it has downward, I don't know if you can see it that well in these pictures, downward um, pointing barbs, triangular leaves, which you can see in these pictures, and then distinguishing characteristic, because this gets confused with a number of like tear thumbs and different vines, um, is this, you can kind of see them here, um, I think it's a, I think you say orsi or osria. I can't say the word, <laughs> but it's a round leaf structure at the leaf stems, and it completely encircles the main stem. So it's not something you see on a lot of plants, um, and it's very distinguishable with myelaminet. I've done some removal of it, and if you are going to long sleeves gloves, if you're going to pull it because they immediately get you and your arms will be covered in um, in cuts from the barbs of the of, of it. It's, it's a very hard plant to pull. It has these bright blueberries um, that are, you know, ripe when they go. 
And then this is some of the invasions um, that we've seen in Connecticut. There's been a big uh, push at the University of Connecticut to do to report these invasions when they come up. Um, so they have some educational materials that you could print out from online. Um, kind of gives you this distinguishing characteristics and then tells you where to report it if, if you do find these in your community. Okay, so now that we've talked about the plants, why do we care? <laughs> um, my reasoning is uh, the detriment of native plants when we have so many invasives in the environment, native wildlife, and then future generations as well. So from descriptions of each plant, you can tell that each one has an effect on biodiversity. But why does it matter? Uh, so biodiversity increases the, stab stable, the stability in ecosystems. So each organism is developed for a specific purpose. And if we have invasive plants that's, that are crowding them out or making them not grow, we're not getting the purpose of each of these plants. Uh, increases productivity in the environment and then decreases susceptibility to biotic invasions. So same as if we're healthier, we can fight off diseases. If our ecosystems are healthier, they can do the same thing. Um, and then I also think of it this way. Bio, for human purposes, biodiversity equals ecosystem services. So what humans gain from the native, natural environment. So clean drinking water, pollination for our food, climate and disease control, oxygen production and clean air, all these things, um, invasive plants are having a negative effect on our environment. So they're, they're taking away some of these um, natural benefits that we get from our environments. So Doug Ptolemy, which Bringing Nature Home, which you have the availability to take out some of those books on the table out there. Uh, they did a lot of research for that book and found that natives versus invasives for biological diversity. So most insects can develop and re reproduce only on plants with which they share an evolutionary history. So think of monarchs and milkweed. Um, so through this study, they found that the amount of pollinators, insects, that native species can uh, sustain is vastly larger. So as you can see, oaks, you know, 534 species. And then some of the, the non-native invasive plants, you know, 5, 10, some of them get a little bit higher than that. But when you compare kind of similar style, you know, tree to tree or vine to vine, always the natives are supporting larger um, amounts of insects and pollinators. Um, and the reason we care about that, I mean, native animals uh, need them to eat to survive. Uh, we need them, again, to pollinate our food. And then I also think about the future. So it might, kind of, it might sound a little bit preachy, but I think of my son. So his first real word was outside. Right? <laughs> but I don't want him to think of outside as winged euonymus, or burning bush, or even grass in our front yard. You know, you want them to think about native plants and the connections to wildlife, to pollinators. Um, you want them to be able to explore these things in the future for it to be here for future generations. And also for the healthy benefits that our natural environments create. So, what can we do? So, in this book, if you do check it out, or if you get it, um, in the future, you can buy it online, I'm sure on Amazon. Um, he sort of gives you a, a map of, of what to do. Um, lists of native plants for your area. You can also find that on various websites. Uh, Connecticut Invasive Plant Working Group has a natives list. Um, there's some good local nurseries that source native plants from this area. Um, so you can find uh, places to get this in Connecticut. And then in this book, it also shows you the host of plants for butterflies and moths. So it shows you the connections between some of the species that you might want to plant and what you might find 
um, coming to your yard afterwards once you've planted these, these species. Uh, one would be kind of a butterfly garden. Um, gives you different uh, species which might be good for supporting monarchs, for supporting different types of caterpillars, for supporting all kinds of pollinators. Um, as you know, most pollinators, like I said before, can only eat or reproduce on one, some maybe three species, but they're, they're pretty limited in the amount of species that they can, they can use. And then, at all costs, <laughs> avoid invasive plants for planting in your own yards. Um, we can't just rely on the open spaces that Guilford has or that the state has. Um, it has to start at our yards too because there's just not enough open space in Connecticut to support all the wildlife. Um, and if you really like a non-native plant, it's okay, <laughs> as long as it's not invasive. <laughs> um, you can get resources on SIPWIG's website for um, alternatives, uh, and then contact myself or anyone else on that website. There's other email addresses other contact information for people who can help. Some native alternatives, uh, so for Japanese barberry, people love it for the, for the fall color. It gets kind of purpley, some a little bit red. Um, but common nine bark, which is a native plant, um, has a similar color, and you can, get, uh, you can get that plant in local nurseries. Same thing with winged euonymus. There are native alternatives to all these plants. Uh, for their beauty, at least, um, we can find alternatives to them. There is a native honeysuckle, trumpet honeysuckle, which I personally think is more beautiful. Um, the flowers, at least, are much more beautiful, and it will help native pollinators, native birds. I'm sure some of you know about Blazing Star, but um, Purple Loosestrife has more than just Blazing Star as alternatives, but this is one that looks very similar, has the same pretty color, um, and relatively easy to get in native nurseries. So we can also manage invasive plants. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but there is new information uh, on SIPWIG's website. We just worked on a calendar of when to manage and what what kind of management is the best is supposedly the best way to manage these plants. Uh, the information was collected from experts, from contractors, from scientists, from researchers across the state that do this kind of work regularly. So it's it started with ten plants, and the hope is that it'll grow to the whole list of ninety seven. Um, but for right now, there are ten plants up there. <coughs> I'm pretty sure all 10 plants are the ones I talked about tonight. Uh, it, it's, it's a good resource for you to get started on some of this management. So people are, one of the things people always ask, it's the first question, when's the best time to manage invasive species? <laughs> and so what we say is, right now. <laughs> uh, if it's not the ideal time, at least if you cut it back um, before it seeds, you might prevent some of the spread. Um, you might prevent bittersweet from getting worse and climbing up and killing another tree. Uh, so always start now. Um, there is a best time to for each plant, but uh, you might not be able to do it at that best time. So who knows? Um, also, consider blooming periods for uh, plants, especially if you plan on using chemical treatments. Uh, we just talked about pollinators, and we want to make sure that we're not harming them when we do use chemicals. So think about blooming periods, maybe do it slightly before or slightly after, so there's, there's at least less pollinators coming to those plants when you're, when you're doing treatment. And then forever monitor. <laughs> As I've said before, a lot of these plants have uh, viability for seeds in the soil for years and years and years. Um, so you can't just cut or 
treat and leave and think it's gone. Uh, yes, birds and other animals will bring them back in, but there's already a seed base in your soils, especially if those plants have been there for a while. I, yeah, I have a slide. So mechanical control, um, it can be effective on small scales, uh, can delay this pre and prevent seed production, it can ble deplete the plant's resources, but on a large scale it's very, very time consuming, <laughs> very hard work. Uh, you have to be out there constantly and if you have a property that's bigger than a couple acres, it's, it's really, really tough to, to make any headway. Um, it's more discouraging than anything else. So um, follow-up is always necessary. And if you cut it, a lot of plants, if you cut them, you walk away, like I was talking about with bittersweet earlier, you're only making the problem worse because it's going to root sucker and it's going to have 10 times more shoots than it did the year before. So if you're only planning on cutting and you want to do that in your yard, that's great because you can get out there, you know, once a week and cut it and you will finally deplete the resources. But um, on large scale, it's, it's very tough. Um, for pulling, uh, mowing, it might be effective on smaller young plants. Uh, garlic mustard, there has been some effective uh, large scale volunteer efforts. If you have an isolated area of garlic mustard, just doing hand pulling. Um, I mean, if you get all, if you get, the roots out, um, certainly you can make an impact on something like garlic mustard, but you have to be on it constantly because they do have that viability in the seeds. Uh, also young shrubs and vines, and if you are going to use equipment, mowers, uh, brush cutters, chainsaws, safety is key. Okay, so just remember um, to always follow proper protocol. Something like this is widely used with invasive plant removal for mechanical efforts. It's called the Puller Bear. Um, there are other brands. One's called the Extractigator, another one, Uprooter. I think the Extractigator might not be in business anymore because there's not that much demand for it. But I know Puller Bear is still in, um, in demand and selling. So the premise of it is you get, um, they have, you can put a piece of wood to get a little bit of leverage, but you grab the base of, you know, a large vine or a large uh, shrub, something like autumn olive, and you use your body force to pull it out, and it pretty much gets all the roots. But that's the thing is, if you leave a little bit of root, it's going to come back. So it's a, it's a constant, you know, going back and checking, but this can be a useful tool. Useful tool. Um, I always say this would be the ideal for every invasive plant if we could find a biological control. Uh, it's basically using a natural enemy, so a fungus or a bug um, or an animal, something that might eat it or deplete its resources or deplete just you know enough of it so that it becomes part of the environment. Uh, but these efforts can take 10 to 20 years to get approval for, uh, especially these days, because they worry about, you know, if you introduce a new bug, what is it going to eat? So they do testing on it for years and years and years. Uh, they try to pull in every plant that it might eat and see if it eats it. And then finally, if it passes all the tests, it can get released and uh, be used as a treatment method. So in Connecticut, we have a weevil that they use to treat mile a minute weed. They've been doing that for 10 years maybe. And it's doing pretty well. It, it eats the leaves and um, depletes the resources of the plant. And then purple loosestrife has a beetle that eats the leaves. And in some areas where they've released this beetle, purple <laughs> loosestrife has sort of become a part of the environment instead of taking over like a monoculture. So this is sort of the ideal, and this is what some people say, well, wait a thousand years, and you know, these plants will find, they'll, they'll be natural enemies for these plants, which is probably the case um, if we wait and wait and wait until things adapt. But uh, in the meantime, we'll, we'll have lost you know, a lot of native, native plants, native species. 
Um, so we have to do something before that happens. And then chemical control, uh, safety is key, and the label is the law. So if uh, you're going to be thinking about using chemicals, whether it's in a backpack sprayer or a little spray bottle, or they even have, oh, I forget what they're called, it's basically like those kids like paint, uh, I forget what they're called. They're, it's like a, a little paint thing, you can put chemical in it, it has a little sponge on the bottom, and if you cut it and you're just painting the, bot, the top of the thing, it's, it's pretty effective for cutting and painting stumps. Um, always use personal protective equipment, so if it calls for gloves and long sleeves, a mask, um, wear what the label says because it's protecting yourself. Uh, and then I always say be selective, be very selective with chemicals, choose the time of year that's best, uh, where you're going to create you know, less issues with native plants, uh, the process that's the best. So if you're treating an invasive and you know, Japanese barberry comes out early in the spring but nothing else is green yet, treat Japanese barberry then if you can because then you're going to have the least effect on the natives when they do come up. Um, again, uh, blooming periods, be weary um, because of pollinators. So if you do have an invasive growing next to or re relatively close to a, a nice native um, that's blooming at that time, just be weary of using chemicals at that period of time. And then always use caution, pick the right method, the right chemical for the plant. Uh, there are certain chemicals that, so I have several strategies up here. So you have foliar spraying, cut and paint, injection, pre-emergent, and depending on the plant that you're using, certain chemicals are gonna be better. So if you're wanting to get down into the rhizome system of Japanese knotweed, um, some people use an injection method because you're going to be getting the chemical directly into that plant and it's not going to be going anywhere else. Um, but if you, use, if you use an injection method on a Japanese uh, knotweed, you have to use more chemical if you inject it than if you foliar spray it. So sometimes people will cut down Japanese knot, knotweed, let it regrow a little bit, and then spray it with a less concentrated uh, amount of chemical on top. So there are different ways, different methods that are more effective or work better for your environment. So just make sure you're, you're checking the latest uh, studies. And then last, disposal. Um, this is key. Some species will reroot. Um, like I said before, rhizomes of knotweed can reroot. They can go down in uh, water systems and get up onto new banks and create new invasions. Something like garlic mustard, um, if you pull garlic mustard out and you leave it in the woodlands, it has so much energy stored in the plant that it can continue to ripen the seeds uh, and still produce seed. So stuff like that, if, if it has any seed on it at all, if it's not the basil rosettes for garlic mustard, if you pull it out, you should bag it. Um, so always thinking about, you know, which species are going to do what um, and making sure you're disposing of them properly so that you're not spreading them to other areas um, that aren't harmed or creating worse invasions for the future. When, when you say bag it, um, yeah. what do you do with it once you've bagged it? So if you, if you take and you black, well... There's a few ways you can you can either bag it in regular trash bags and throw it away in the trash. Um, so it will burn at the transportation. Yeah, use. yeah. Or um, sometimes people will bring it out, put it you know on a tarp, put another tarp over it, let it dry out, and then dispose of it. Um, you just don't want to release the seeds back into the environment is the main concern. And then as I said before. Monitor forever. <laughs> um, you don't get out of this step with invasive plants. Um, definitely monitor the ones you know are there and keep managing them. 
but have an eye out for newcomers. So with climate change, uh, bringing new invaders, with warming climate, we are starting to see more southern species come up. Uh, and they're doing, you know, different groups are doing studies on these plants. Um, but I would say as our climate warms, we're going to see more and more of these species coming north. Um, so just be, be weary and be out there looking at what you have. I, yes, I will at the end. I have a couple more slides and then I can go back to it. So in Connecticut, we do have some legislation. Um, it, it established the Invasive Plants Council, which promotes education, research, and awareness. Um, we have the list of 97 species. 81 of them are banned. So by statute, there is a $100 per plant fine, um, which, in, which includes importing, moving, selling, purchasing, transporting, and distributing. Um, and it authorizes conservation officers, I guess police officers could as well enforce it, but I would, there really isn't much enforcement <laughs> other than, uh, you know, a nursery if it's on the ban list. If they have it in their nursery and you see it, you can get them in trouble. But a homeowner transplanting it, move it there's just no way to track all of that. Um, we don't have enough enforcement officers in the state of Connecticut for the land that we have under the state ownership, so it's very hard um, at the town-based level to enforce these things. Uh, this is the website that I have been mentioning a few times. Uh, there's plant information, uh, there's control information, disposal information on there, there's uh, now, now there's a 2018 symposium tab, which has all the workshops from our October symposium. And uh, the calendar of treatment options is in that section. There's also contact information for various people that can help um, or give more information. It's a great resource, um, and it will give you more resources to use. So there's an endless amount of resources on this website. And then, if you're still interested in this in 2020, you can join us. We just had our uh, biennial conference this year, so we will have it again in 2020. Uh, it's up at stores. It usually draws a crowd of about 500 people. And there are workshops on pollinators. There are workshops on um, manage, <coughs> diving more in depth into the management of some of these plants. Uh, it's a great day. There's also... Usually we have a plant display where you can come and actually like feel and see the plants in person. Um, so definitely join us if you're still interested. And then I can take questions. So actually, it's inter this is actually the plant. <laughs> I can go back to the slide that shows it larger. But that's Japanese barberry. Um, that has a really high propensity for having ticks. Any questions? What about mugwort? I had mugwort in the in the presentation and felt I had probably five or six more species and it was like, meh, mm -hmm. and cut it out. But that is another one um, that they're, it's on the list. Um, it takes over disturbed sites. It takes over meadows. Um, there are certainly more than what I presented on tonight. <laughs> English ivy? That's not, um, not considered invasive. It's non-native, really? I think, but it, I don't think it's on the list of invasive plants. I can go back and double check, but I don't think English ivy is. <clears throat> you mentioned burning bush as being one of those that's still being sold, but is also invasive. Does that mean that you should take it all out of your yard? Or, or are we still in a kind of a gray zone? No, it's an invasive. Yeah. I it's, to it, out. it is definitely invasive. Um, the only reason it didn't get banned is, like I said before, because this uh, this group that decides that originally decided included scientists, researchers, um, <coughs> professionals, and landscape and people in the nursery business, and it was one of their best sellers. So they lobbied hard to to keep it from getting banned. So yeah, I would say if you have it and you have woodlands close by, 
it's probably spreading into the woodlands um, from your yard, <laughs> sadly. Butterfly bush. Uh, I, I don't know. I think that one is non-native, but I don't think it's called the considered invasive. I mean, it just spreads like crazy. There are a lot of plants, uh, even native plants, that that spread like crazy, but they do they don't take over um, wild places. I guess is the the key ingredient. If they're going to take over natural lands, if we're seeing it in uh, meadows that are protected and, and open spaces taking over, then it, it may be considered for the invasives list. Uh, they do review it every year, um, and researchers are, talk about different plants getting added to the list, but I think it's been steady at 97 for five, six years now, so we haven't added anything else. Nurseries that are selling, um, quote, new, new cultivars of Japanese mm -hmm. barberry that are smaller, that they say are not invasive and are not a problem. Is that true or is that just <laughs> yeah. sort of a... It depends. Um, Yukon, I'm pretty sure it's Yukon, is doing studies on a few different plants. I'm pretty sure Japanese barberry is one of them where they've been um, creating cultivars that are that have no viability by the seeds, and they've been doing studies for five or six years and found that they don't have any viability. I'm not sure that they made it to the nurseries yet, though. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure. But, uh, but it's, it's a good thing to be leery of, um, because there are a lot of plants where they're saying cultivar, cultivars are not viable seeds, but they're finding then that Maybe they're not viable for a couple of years, but then three years down the line they're viable and they're spreading and they're creating invasions as well. Yeah, the knotweed is proliferating on the roadside and they seem to just let it grow until it's about to cover the road and they cut it back. Is there any push to like more aggressively eradicate the stuff earlier? Yeah, um, so DOT does get in, into conversations with uh, Connecticut Invasive Plant Working Group. Um, they have minimal, minimal projects where they do some work on that kind of stuff, but um, they're not at the point yet where they're doing a good job of, of treating invasives when they cut stuff back and when they, um, when they treat the roadsides. But yes, I agree. Every time I drive by a big patch of that or another invasive, I'm like, oh, why are we not doing a better job? <laughs> Probably. There aren't great uh, disposal regulations um, in the state, sadly. For big construction problem uh, projects, I think they might have to, but uh, I don't think with the roadside stuff that they have a regulation on it. So on that same subject, I've been curious and mystified for many years why, what is the barrier, and whether it's for state officials or in the, along the shoreline, Guilford and Madison are the ones I'm familiar with, the local town officers, they know what invasives are. Certainly they are aware of the problem with Phragmites and many of these others, and yet they don't seem to feel any, when you talk to them, no responsibility, no local activities going on, no local awareness campaigns. You guys do a lot of lobbying at the state level, but like DOT, you can, it's great that you're getting all of these things banned, but if DOT is merrily going up yeah. and down the roadsides, cutting things down and leaving their things there and making it worse, then this, the surface, the right. grass tops advocacy is not actually being very effective. Yeah, it's true. And someone said that at the symposium this year. It's like, well, how can we get all these groups? This is great. We're having a campaign. And my, my thing for advocacy stuff is they need to hear from all of you. <laughs> um, at the state level, uh, when we do advocacy work, I mean, if they hear from five people, that's a lot of people at the state level for them to hear from. So if invasive plants became an issue that they were hearing from more people um, at the state level, maybe we would have more policy. Um, I mean, bamboo, which is not even considered an invasive at this point, running bamboo, 
um, was causing some property damage on a few key people who pushed and pushed and pushed, and there is now, in last two or three years, legislation on it. So that's always my thing, is if, if we don't, you know, make a, make a fuss, um, it won't happen, um, especially at the state level. Leg legislators. legislators. Yeah, I mean, you can contact to get information. You can contact uh, UConn, but any state employee, they're not going to be able to go and advocate for these things. The voice for to the legislators have to come from you guys. Um, so say five people from Guilford contacted your state rep and your state legislator, it would be like, hmm, maybe we should take a look at invasive plants. Um, but a lot of people don't do that um, advocacy, so it's hard to get that stuff to happen. <laughs> well, when, when you talk about contacting how to do something, so what, what would be the ideal way for a town to respond to... For invasive plants? Right. Um, you can talk about the negative habitat, uh, the loss to property values, um, no, I meant in terms of what they can do about it. I mean, what, oh, I mean, at the who, who state the one to at the state level, um, they can pressure the Invasive Plant Council, which creates the list, um, which created the bans. Uh, they can probably pressure DOT um, to change their regulations on uh, invasive plant removal. Um, legislators have a lot more power than we give them credit for. Uh, yeah, I mean. Your legislator had, probably has many avenues of making change at the state level. But I think the practical level, if you even just go down by sea, if you tariffs, it would be so expensive and so labor and time consuming for them to do it. To you mean? actually do something in the town budget. I'm not saying it's not a worthwhile project, but I think part of the barrier is that even if people were on board, it's, it's so prolific. Well, and but my thing for um, for managing is thinking long term. So if we thought about yes, right now Japanese barberry or knotweed is crazy in these environments. But if you if you did a good job and you got a native base back in your, you wouldn't have to be doing anything for. I mean, you'd be going back and hand pulling small things, but. You wouldn't have to be going back as DOT and constantly cutting Japanese knotweed every year and spending that manpower, that gasoline, that, you know, all of that effort um, if you could do a good job at the start. So if you think long, I mean, that's probably part of the problem. We don't think long term in budgets. So they're usually yearly budgets, so they, it doesn't fit into yearly budget. But if you thought about it um, 10 years from now, it might make sense um, for state budgets. Where does the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection figure into your... Um, Are they an ally to what you, your mission? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're an ally in that they, on state parks and in some state forests, they are doing some of this work. Um, so in state forests, I know where they do management. Uh, they're making sure that they do invasive treatment beforehand, so if they open up the canopy, they're not introducing more light for more invasives to grow. Um, they're, an, they're an ally, they're a resource, they know a lot about the topic. Same thing with UConn, uh, who does a lot of research on this, uh, but they're, they're not going to advocate for changes to the legislature. So. But it would seem to be, just be more effective to um, work through Environmental protection agency than the DOT. I'll bet you the invasive eradication than the DOT is just a byproduct of does it impede traffic, then we'll cut it out. They're not looking right. for invasives. Well, they're not, but they should be. <laughs> That's the point. Is that they have I I would say along the roadsides they have probably have some of the largest and worst inva and worst invasive problems in the state. Um, and they're not really doing much to treat it, so yeah, if we can if we can get a few key people in DOT involved, then it would be great. Um, just one or two more questions. Um, the library closes at eight, so we we endeavor to be out by then. So, um, but did any anyone have any other questions that um, you can 
Um, there's a really invasive plant down south called kudzu. It's here. It's here. Yeah, so. It's in Greenwich, at least. Oh, <laughs> Greenwich, no. I don't it's, know. it's actually in other parts of the state as well, but um, it we haven't seen it take over quite as bad yet, but it, it I think it has the potential in the future um, to be one of those, grow over everything as a mat, um, crazy invasives, but it's here, but it hasn't taken over quite as bad as south. I mean, really, if anyone wants to see some, I mean, if you've probably been south, maybe you you could just seen Google it, it and you, you'll oh, see. Oh, it, it is just incredible if you need an inspiration to get rid of it. <laughs> so, uh, I Sarah just want to, Loretta, with the reference librarian, was kind enough to uh, purloin extra copies of Bringing Nature Home, Doug Talney's book. So, just if you want it, feel free to grab it. Just be sure to check it out <laughs> because they don't belong to us. But there are, I think, five or six copies for anyone to check out if they're interested. Okay, um, first of all, thank you very much, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. And thank you very much also for the contact information. We yeah. appreciate that. Um, any chance we can have access to this PowerPoint? Yeah, or I can send it to That would be great. Yeah. And then we could perhaps put it on the town website. Is that yeah, put it on our on, on the conservation page, so that would be great. And also, there is a, a sheet in the back if anyone is interested in signing up for information on upcoming programs, or if you'd like to get involved, if you'd like to help our friend uh, Doug, <laughs> uh, working out in the trails, or, uh, or if you'd like to just reach out to us for any reason, please just leave your contact information. We'll be happy to follow up. So once again, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, you for having me.